Welcome to the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. My name is Erin McCleskey. I'm the Public Education Manager here at the museum. Tonight's presentation is being recorded, so it will be available for viewing on our website, cooperhewitt.org, as are all of our public programs, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, I'm very pleased to have this program here tonight. It should be a really wonderful program that Phyllis Ross has put together. So I'm very pleased also to welcome um, to the program Russell Flincham, who's a design historian, curator, author, and longtime friend of the Cooper Hewitt, who will introduce the speakers and tonight's program. So please welcome Russell. Thank you. I'm going to introduce people individually before they come up to speak. And of course, we're going to start with Phyllis Ross, who uh, <laughs> Phyllis and I go a long way back. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, the time we spent working together on the Dreyfus show back in the 90s sort of cemented our friendship and our relationship. And uh, uh, certainly Phyllis knows what it's like to go through a multi-year uh, process in generating a work, but I, I, she's come up with an absolutely beautiful book. I hope if you have not seen it, you'll take a chance to look at it sometime tonight and certainly consider buying a copy. Anyway, Phyllis Ross is an independent researcher and scholar based in New York City. She is a graduate of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, Parsons, the New School for Design, MA program in the Decorative Arts. She has helped develop exhibitions at the Detroit Institute of Arts, Cooper Hewitt, the Library of Congress, the National Building Museum, and the Museum of the City of New York. She began her career as a landscape architect and contributed most recently to the exhibition catalog for the exhibition Paris, New York, Design, Fashion, Culture, 1925 to 1940, published last year by Monticelli Press. Her book, Gilbert Rohde, Modern Design for Modern Living, published by Yale University Press this very year, is the basis and the inspiration for tonight's discussion. So please welcome Phyll Phyllis Ross. Please. Thank you, Russell. And my thanks to the other panelists for joining me in what I think is going to be a very interesting and lively conversation in which we'll look at Gilbert Rohde's career in light of design today. Thanks also to Kara McCarty, curatorial director of the Cooper Hewitt, for supporting the idea of this panel, and to Erin McCluskey for organizing the program. Before I begin uh, a, a brief overview of Rhodey's career, I want to welcome some special members of the audience. Um, Lee Rhodey, Gilbert Rhodey's son, is here with his wife, Mary. and. Um, it's thanks to Lee that the Cooper Hewitt has a collection of materials from Gilbert Rohde's office, a small archive here at the museum, which he donated some years ago. And other members of the Rohde family are also here, um, Joan and Charlie Holcomb and Kristen and Michael Sharp. And thanks, everybody else, for coming. So I'm going to kind of set the stage for the discussion that will follow and give you a brief overview of Rhodey's career and his accomplishments. He was he's not a household name today, except in a very small number of households. You can guess which ones those are. But in his, uh, in his own time, he was considered by some to have been the most influential furniture designer of his time. In the 1930s and early 40s, he was acclaimed as an innovator in design, furniture systems, and the use of new materials. He began his career at the age of 33 in 1927, his passport photograph of that year. He was based in New York City and had been working in advertising illustration for 10 years after a stint as a political cartoonist. As an illustrator, he became a specialist in drawings of furniture and interiors for department stores. And it was from that career that he segued into furniture design. And I think this illustration shows his skill and style very well. He began his career as a designer with private commissions and limited edition furniture designs. And um, 
this was the first national publicity he received for a penthouse apartment in Greenwich Village. And uh, just point out to you this table here is the same one shown here. And uh, it was actually a combination bookcase and bar. It was during Prohibition when maybe you didn't want everybody to see your liquor stash. But by 1931, just a few years after he began his design career, he had already uh, started designing for mass production, the work that would define his career. His first client was the Haywood Wakefield Company. And uh, this chair um, is probably the best known piece from his group for Haywood Wakefield. And uh, an example of it is in the Metropolitan Museum collection. But his most important client, manufacturer client, was the Herman Miller Furniture Company. And beginning in 1932 until 1944, when he died at the age of 50, he served as their design consultant. And you can see by 1942, after 10 years with Herman Miller, uh, they had raised their profile from a regional manufacturer with a showroom in Grand Rapids to a company with showrooms in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. And that is Gilbert Rohde's furniture shown in this advertisement. Designing for industry, Rohde developed his most innovative furniture for the home and office. And I'm showing you a couple of examples of these innovative designs. On the top is a molded plexiglass chair, which anticipated molded plastic furniture by a decade. It was done in 1939. And below, a biomorphic table, part of a group in 1941. His prototypes and designs for mass production and his ideas for furniture systems, which I'll be speaking about in a moment, constituted the primary bridge from the 1930s to the mid-century modernism of the post-war era. And just to um, show you how advanced Rhodey was in comparison to where manufacturers were, um, at the top we see actually a bedroom group that was made by Herman Miller and displayed in 1930 in their Grand Rapids showroom. And just six or seven years later, part of a bedroom suite that Rhodey designed for the company. Similarly, when it came to office furniture, most office furniture manufacturers were producing designs that incorporated period details, like this Gothic suite from Stowe Davis. In stark contrast is Rhodey's very sleek office furniture, also made by Herman Miller and debuted in 1942. In the late 1920s, when Rhodey entered the field of design, manufactured furniture consisted almost entirely of period designs. The only exceptions were a few pieces that were inspired by the 1925 Paris Decorative Arts Expo Exposition. And this piece um, made by Herman Miller is along those lines. And people might be kind of surprised if they're familiar with Herman Miller today to discover that Herman Miller, in fact, before Gilbert Rohde, was making very traditional furniture. This was also the time when industrial design was emerging as a profession in the way that we think of it today. And Rohde approached his work for furniture manufacturers from the perspective of an industrial designer. He believed that the industrial designer had a multifaceted role that encompassed marketing and advertising, production issues, even quality control. And he uh, typically also arranged showrooms for his clients, developed product catalogs, and, and a variety of other activities. He believed that the industrial designer needed to understand consumer psychology and anticipate consumer needs. And he believed that he was in a position to do that. He was certainly not the only modernist who was designing furniture for manufacturers. Um, oh, I just want to mention this is an example of an advertisement that 
in which Rody wrote the text, did the graphic design, and it's his own furniture that's being shown, an example of you know, one of the many services that he provided for the company. Donald Desky and Russell Wright, contemporaries of Rody's, and just to name two prominent furniture designers of the 30s who also worked for manufacturers. And I think you can see that some of Donald Esky's and Rody's furniture looked very much alike. If you focus on the vanity in Desky's suite for the Esty company and, and look at Rody's, I think you can see that there's uh, quite a resonance there. Similarly, Russell Wright designed a coordinated group for the Haywood Wakefield Company the same year that Rody designed a similar group for Herman Miller. Again there's a resonance between the two designers. Both of these groups featured modular furniture. And uh, a couple of examples are back here, two identical cabinets. Although Wright and others experimented with modular furniture, Rody made it a mission of his to promote it. And more than any other designer of his time, he did promote modular furniture, not only for Herman Miller, but other manufacturers as well. Furniture design remained the focus of his career, whereas in Desky's case, he went on to become a specialist in packaging design. And Wright became known very much for his tablewares. The idea of modular furniture really began in Germany shortly after 1900 with the work of Bruno Paul and others. And um, Marcel Breuer picked up on this concept uh, in the 20s and developed his own ideas about modular furniture, which actually Gilbert Rohde saw in 1927 when he visited the Bauhaus in Dessau. And then a few years later, Rohde brought out an extensive line of coordinated line of furniture that included a dozen modular units. And I don't have much time, but I just want to point out a little bit about this. I think you can see that there were a variety of units, and they could be arranged in many different sequences. And uh, this piece, for example, was designed as kind of a home bar. Uh, the, the drawers here pulled out. They could be used as serving trays when they weren't used as for storing glasses. And the uh, compartments here were designed to store liquor bottles, mixers, and so forth. The furniture was compact, and arrangement of it was flexible, and it was all very functional. And it was designed for furnishing small homes and one room, two room, and three room apartments. Consumers could add more pieces as they needed them. And in addition to the dozen modular units, there were 38 other pieces, occasional tables, uh, dining tables, and so forth. There were also, OK, this, um, this is a page from a catalog in which the Laurel group is explained. And a model of the one room apartment, which you see here in a photograph was made and circulated to department stores that carried Herman Miller's lines to show consumers how they could use this furniture. There were also pieces in the Laurel line that had dual purposes, such as the combination lamp table. And this dining table below which could be converted to a dinette table by adjusting the end leaves, which slid under the top. Emblematic of Rohde's thinking about furniture design was his belief that people were the most important element in any room. This was a kind of new idea for a furniture manufacturer. He once told Herman Miller's president, DJ Dupree, you're not just making furniture anymore. You are creating a lifestyle. Rody was quick to see that consumer education was essential to the acceptance of modular furniture and his other innovative ideas. 
In product catalogs he developed for Herman Miller, he explained the origins of modern furniture and its benefits, efficiency, functionality, but not in any way sacrificing beauty. One of the benefits of Rohde's groups was choice. In many of his lines, the consumer had the ability to choose the color of the wood finish, the hardware, and even what kind of legs would be used to support the unit. So in the mahogany group, which was from 1937, uh, the consumer could choose these metal legs or wood legs or just have a flat wood base and either a light or dark color was available as well as even some other colors. His work encompassed a diverse aesthetic that mirrored trends in art and architecture. His earliest work expressed a machine aesthetic evident in this chrome and bakelite table of 1928. Other designs, like this vanity, incorporated streamlining, and another reflected ar modern architectural design with a cubic mass juxtaposed with flat glass and wood planes. Still later, Rohde drew on surrealism as a source for biomorphic forms, which he began incorporating in interiors and furniture. And you can see how the work of Jean Arp is closely related to shapes that Rodi used, as well as shapes in the, in the paintings of Miro. <clears throat> this was Herman Miller's showroom in Chicago, opened in 1939. He also incorporated biomorphic forms in furniture in the Paldeo line, and uh, these were actually the first pieces of furniture manufactured in America that incorporated forms like this, which became so important in mid-century moder modernism after World War II. He thought about furniture in terms of systems. We've already seen the coordinated line with the modular units. And it was the idea was to meet the changing needs of modern life. It was this analytical process that led to his executive office group. The first office furniture system based on interchangeable components. With this system, the consumer could choose from among various sizes of desktops, uh, pedestal arrangements, different kinds of bases, and so forth. So I'll just point out to you, uh, for example, a desk could be designed so that it was attached to a wall, or it could be freestanding, like this one or this one, a variety of bases. And uh, the pedestals could be arranged in various different ways. According to the way somebody liked to work, how much space they had, and the kind of work they did. It was also possible to customize desks in terms of drawers, how they were configured and arranged, and also the interiors of the drawers themselves. So you can see that there were various inserts. And then uh, drawers could be stacked in a variety of different arrangements. Again, a choice of hardware and even a desk with a plate glass top supported by tubular chrome steel. Rohde's ideas became the model for office furniture systems in the post-war era and, and still relates very much to how some office furniture lines are presented today. By focusing on mass-produced furniture, Rohde hoped to ensure that modern design would be affordable to a broad base of consumers. One of his last design concepts was an entertainment center for the Admiral Radio Corporation. And you'll notice that, quite remarkably, it incorporates a flat screen TV, quite ahead of its time. And the uh, the streamlined cabinets rest on a metal stand, very forward-looking. <clears throat> In 
This concept is proof, if we needed it, that had he lived longer, he would have continued to produce groundbreaking work. So that's the end of my presentation on Rhodey, and I hope it sets the stage for the discussion to follow and people have an idea of the range of his work and his ideas. Okay, thank you.